Thank you for coming. Um, documentation seems to be a bit of a problem for a lot of our software developers. Um, so I just want to understand a bit you know, how you think about it here. Um, just as a quick show of hands, could you put your hand up and keep it up if you write code as part of your work? OK, you're in the right conference. This is good. Uh, keep your hand up if you've written some documentation in the last year, I should say. OK, uh, most of you, you see. Now keep your hand up if you liked it. <laughs> right, so a few of you do, and most of the rest of you just aren't willing to admit it in public. Some of you maybe don't like writing documentation. I think this is maybe a problem. So we're going to start with looking at what is the documentation problem, where does this come from? Starting with what causes documentation? You know, why do we need to have it? I'm tough on the causes of software documentation. That is exactly right. Um, for those sitting in the front, sorry if the text is too big. I hope you'll manage. So documentation is, for example, caused by these. These are, as you know, M&Ms, which are better known as managers and meetings, demand documentation. They want to see some kind of physical, tangible result. They want something on the table in the meeting. So. When you're working in a scenario where you have managers, which is quite common, um, and when you're asked to attend meetings, which is sadly also quite common, um, you'll be likely to ask for documentation. So other people want documentation. Sometimes, yeah, and, and meetings, um, I'm calling it failure demand. This is something good to Google later. Uh, it's a reason for documentation, and it represents some kind of failure to already know everything. We don't already know everything. We don't always know what's going on. So another reason for documentation is that sometimes you join a project, and this happens. Um, not literally, and I'm not even talking about the JavaScript frameworks, but sometimes we find ourselves working in unfamiliar domains. So we, we start working, and this is the first time we've worked on a project in banking, or the first time we're in supply chain, and there's all sorts of jargon. And we need to know what it means. We need to know what's going on. So these unfamiliar names also create some demand for documentation, because we, need, we want to read an explanation. This is because some domains are just complicated. You know, it's not reasonable to just already know it or to just have somebody explain it in five minutes. So this is another reason for documentation. Here's another, a little bit indirect. So this is a stage play in London. It's a performance of a Shakespeare play um, in the Globe Theatre, in fact. And so I'm told that around 1600, when this was first performed, that the audience knew what it was about. They understood the jokes. It was lots of cultural references. It didn't really have to be explained. But when I was at school, it was really hard to understand any of the text in any of Shakespeare's plays. The language was all kind of wrong. You know, this is, this is not modern English. And so I now understand that this is what we call legacy poetry. Missed that one. Um, it's, you know, it's good stuff, but it, we just don't understand it anymore. And so this, we have this in code as well. We have legacy code, which at the time was completely reasonable, and everybody understood it and laughed at the jokes. No, they weren't jokes because it was code. But you know what I mean, that it's not that it's bad because it's legacy. It's just that we now don't understand what the people at the time knew. So if we're going to still understand this code, it's going to need some explanation. This is another reason why we need some documentation. Um, and as classic programmer paintings so excellently pointed out, um, in this uh, example of developers looking for documentation of a legacy system, it's not always available. Um, so as discovered, this is centuries later, this is a French painter called uh, Jean-Francois Millet, um, you know, painting this scene in rural France, of oh, developers, looking for the legacy documentation. So the documentation is frequently not there, which is a problem. So the demand for documentation is a problem. The absence of documentation is a problem as well. It's all very frustrating. It gets worse. We don't need documentation if we already know everything, or failing that if the person next to you already knows everything. But they leave. So um, there's a developer called Rob Smolsher who's done some simulation and modeling of the dynamics of development teams. And he worked out, and I quote, if you work on a team that numbers 10 developers in total, you can expect half of them, five, 
to leave at some point in the next 3.1 years. 3.1 years is the half-life of your development team members. They decay, they disappear. Now, that's, that's not surprising and doesn't sound bad necessarily because, you know, things happen, people move on. It's a problem because the half-life of everything else is longer. Companies, classes, um, lines of code. So lines of code, he reckons, have a half-life of 13 years. After 13 years, half of the code is still there. And so the million-dollar question is this. If you start today on a new project with 10 people and you write code for several years, after how many years is most of the code written by somebody who's no longer in the room? That only takes a few years, four or five years. So that's kind of another explanation of what we mean by legacy code. Legacy code is just code written by somebody else, right? And there's no explanation. So we can't fight these things. Um, there are inevitable causes of the need for documentation. You know, we can't really ignore it. We've tried quite hard as a community of programmers to ignore documentation, and it doesn't really work very well. We don't get away with that. You know, as we saw earlier, you still have to write the documentation, and most of you don't like it. But some of you do, and I'm one of those as well. I like writing documentation, which is why I wanted to understand everybody else, or almost everybody else, what's going on. And what I discovered is that there are many ways that you can make coders happy, but most of them boil down to giving coders more time to write code and not do the other things. And so what you probably most want is some tactics for avoiding having to write the documentation. This is probably the most useful thing you can discover if you're in that larger group who would rather not do it. But it is worth figuring out how important is this to you to avoid documentation? How far will you go? Because, for example, the easy way to get out of writing documentation is to just put your phone number in the source code. You'll be on call for the rest of your life, but at least you didn't have to write the documentation, right? I mean, this works, but we need more than strategies that work. We need strategies that are sort of acceptable. This is not appealing, so do not do this. Although, if you're working on my team and you're thinking of leaving the team, do this, please. And I will call you as soon as I have any questions about the code. Um, what we want is more constructive laziness. We want clever ways of avoiding documentation. Um, constructive laziness is also known as the art of turning boring work into a programming problem and getting away with it. We'd much rather do, um, we'd much rather solve problems in kind of programmer type ways. And so this is what I started thinking about. So what follows is not really a technical talk. There's not lots of code. I don't need to show you that side of it. Um, what I need to do, what I hope to do, is to inspire you to solve the documentation problem, at least partly, by thinking about it differently. And you will need to do technical things, but I don't need to tell you how to do those. Those you can figure out by yourself. So you don't need the technical part. Constructive laziness, incidentally, I first read about in this book a long time ago. Um, it's not a new idea. The idea of programmer laziness as a virtue. Embrace your laziness. And so what I, want to, what I do, what I'm thinking now, is let's apply this idea of constructive laziness to software documentation. So let's start with an example of something concrete you can do. What you can do is when somebody comes and asks you a question about your system. So I'm principally thinking about system documentation, documentation about software for developers, for us. When people come and ask you questions, oh, and I've got a text problem. It's on the wiki, it's, on the, you know, it's in the Google Drive, it's, there's, there's documentation somewhere. This guy's respond, you know, picking up the phone and responding to the question by telling someone to go away. And this sometimes works, right? They go away. And actually, there's a general technique here. Just-in-time documentation is not writing documentation and bluffing. <laughs> And sometimes people go away and don't come back. And you just, you know, you, you win at step two. Sometimes they come back. And you can write the documentation a bit later. Now, this has more benefits other than being mildly amusing um, and, and, and working. It means that you write a lot less documentation if this is your approach. It's not perfect. You may annoy people. They may figure out that this is what you're doing. <laughs> 
But the idea that you, you, know, you provide documentation only when it's needed, as late as possible, last responsible moment documentation, you know, to grab an idea from agile software development and apply it to the documentation that's part of what you're doing, is not that crazy an idea. Um, because if people go away and don't come back, that documentation was not so necessary. If you're doing upfront documentation, if you're predicting the future, if you're predicting what questions people are going to have, you're not going to do very well. That's, that's kind of hard. So I'm not kidding. Try this out. At least you'll get a laugh in the office. Um, here's something else you could do. You could, um, instead of writing things down, patiently explain how everything works to your colleagues. This is what's happening in this gratuitous stock photo here. Um, the only catch is that I don't think that's a programmer, because we don't really like doing this either. Um, we don't really want to sort of stop what we're doing and take off the headphones and patiently explain the software, because we'd rather be writing code. So that's not that much better. But at least it's kind of efficient. It's, it's just in time as well, last possible moment. Um, you know, and it turns out that one-on-one, -on -one we can actually communicate quite fast and explain things and get feedback. So it's not terrible. But a better way to do this is to get somebody else to do this. So reverse just-in-time documentation is, is, is much more advanced. I've got a, I've got a colleague, um, and I get him to do this. I'm, I'm looking at some code. You know, There's some Java code, and there's some class. And I think it's the same thing as the other class. I'm looking at these two classes, and I'm thinking, aren't these the same thing? What does it mean? Why do we have one of these? What is, what is the difference between one of these and one of those? So I, I, I Skype him, because we don't work in the same place. I call him up, and I say, hey, Tom. Um, what's one of these? What's, what's this class for? And he tells me, and, I, and while, while, while he's telling me, I type it into the code. There's a documentation comment in the class. He, it took him months to realize out that he was documenting the code and I was just typing it. Um, I think I gave myself away one day when I said, no, slow down, I'm typing. <laughs> but this is quite useful as well. This is also just in time because I didn't, you know, I don't get him to document all of the classes, just the one I'm looking at right now that I need to understand. Um, so, again, this, this, this kind of works. This helps. Right, let's, let's talk about another situation that happens. Um, somebody's leaving the team. It happens uh, quite often. Um, so what do you do? You think, ah, they're going to leave and they're going to take all this knowledge with them. Sort of tacit knowledge. And somebody is going to say, oh, just write everything down. This is a terrible idea. It sounds good. I mean, it sounds very appealing that the person who is going to leave is going to first write everything down. But it's not going to work. And there are lots of things that you know, sound like an excellent idea with the minor flaw that they don't work. And this is one of those. Um, instead, when you need to do some kind of handover because somebody's leaving, use pair programming instead. So this is one of those cases where it's too late for documentation. If somebody's leaving and they've got one month's notice or two months' notice, it's too late. The best thing to do is to handcuff them to the desk and make them pair program for eight hours a day. I mean, it's cruel and intense and hard work, but that's a very good way to get the handover working. You know, if you want to write all that down or video record it or whatever, that's maybe going to help too. And I was joking about the handcuffs, by the way. Don't do that, really. But you know, the idea is that pair programming is um, something that's very useful for transferring knowledge, but it's not persistent, of course. It just delays the problem until the next person leaves. But it's worth bearing in mind that you sometimes need to you know, try something else. Right, um, are there any user interface designers in the room, UX people? OK, look away now. Don't, don't look at the screen. <laughs> um, this happens. I, I, I can't look at this, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. I just saw it online, and I had to look away. It was painful. <laughs> I think it's a Windows user interface for find or grep or something, some, some command line thing with all of the options. Now, this is funny because we know this is bad. But we also have come in our industry to understand that we shouldn't all of us expect to be able to do better. It's a specialist skill, user experience, user interface design. It's a specialist thing. You have it on the team, but you don't expect everybody on the team to do it. You look around the team and you see you know, who's just using Vim and Emacs, and you, maybe you don't want them to design user interface because they, they're, not, they're not graphical user interface people. right? And that's fine. You know, we're, um, We've got used to the idea that not everybody should be doing user interface design. And the same thing applies to the documentation. Not everybody should be doing the documentation. Um, Kevin Henney uh, put this best. Don't expect everybody to be good at it. 
especially, in, you know, and, and actually, this is funny because, well, because it's true, when you need it most is when the person who's responsible for the need for documentation, you know, that's, that's not the person who's going to solve the problem. So you can do quite well to acknowledge that writing docs is a specialist skill. And this is the, ultimately, the best tactic for avoiding writing the documentation is to just get somebody else to do it by making it their job. And there were a few hands up for people who like writing the documentation. So maybe it's you, or maybe it's the person next to you. This shouldn't be a weird idea, but we don't see this very often. And, and this is something that came to me quite recently, that I took on technical writing as, as well as my development work. It turns out that that's really popular with everybody else. I just say, I'll write all the documentation. They love it. And so do I. Right, um, it's time for some cats. Um, but I took away the gratuitous cat photo because that's just <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> I saved you that. I saved you that. It was there in the, in the slide. I don't know. I, um, let's look at a code example, a couple of code examples. So, code comments, I think, are the most hated form of documentation. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but this is possibly because they're in your face when you're writing the code. You can't pretend they don't exist. Um, although there are coders who change the syntax highlighting color to the same as the background color, then they're not in your face, they're invisible. Don't do that, that's a terrible idea. I'm not recommending that. What I'm recommending is obviously improve the code. So in this first example, you can replace the need for the comment or remove the need for the comment by improving the name. Now, naming is kind of hard, famously. So this only works if you can be good at naming. And that's kind of part of the problem. You know, if you're brilliant at naming, you don't need so much documentation. So just be brilliant at naming, right? What's the problem? Anyway, but a name removes the need for the comment. In the second case, um, you know, you can use a type in some programming languages, at least, to remove the need for the comment that explains what kind of data you're dealing with. Types are kind of handy, um, but they're in the code, right? So that's better than writing documentation. Um, Sometimes you have complex code, and this is a kind of a naming thing as well, but in a different way. Name things, introduce concepts, especially when there's just a word for that. Um, and then there are other things where we already have a tool for this, so just don't do this at all, because I'm assuming you're using version control and you don't need to put your name in the code. That belongs somewhere else. These are just a couple of examples. There are many ways that you can re reduce the need for documentation, especially comments, by improving the code. But don't skip that step. Right? Don't, don't say, aha, you know, we can improve the code, therefore we don't need any comments. And then not actually improve the code. Because right? then you've just got bad code and no documentation when you need it. So improve the code. Um, it's worth mentioning that there are some special cases. So here are some exa examples. Um, there, I've got a function uh, method at the bottom called calculate average cuteness of some kittens. And so here's some documentation of pre and post conditions, how this API works. And so I'm thinking that half of the room, I think it's that half, are thinking that this can all be replaced by tests that can communicate this much better. Meanwhile, the other half of the room, it's you lot, you're thinking that if we had a better programming language, we wouldn't need to do this there, we could do it in the code. So those are great things to have. Have tests that make these unnecessary and have better programming languages that make it unnecessary. Your mileage may vary, but look for ways to remove the need for documentation. So, there are several kinds of documentation avoidance, several techniques, mostly coming from constructive laziness, laziness and getting somebody else to do it. And that's a completely reasonable thing to do. So there are some things that I said you shouldn't do, but getting somebody else to write the docs and picking somebody who likes doing it is an excellent idea, because you'll both be happier people. And as developers, maybe we don't spend enough time on our happiness. You know, developer experience is the next, you know, DX is the new UX, right? But sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you fail to get away with the documentation avoidance tactic. So what happens and why? Here's another example. Um, here's a book, War and Peace. I have not read this book, obviously. I mean, it's way too long. Like, who has the time? And so does anybody know what this is about? Because I have no idea. Right, well, suppose, suppose you're telling me that I should read this book. You say, great, you should read the book. I'm going to say, what's it about? 
right? What's it about? You know, is this my kind of book? You know, is this something I want to read? Is this going to solve my entertainment and enlightenment and education problem? If you said to me, oh, no, I don't have to tell you what it's about. Just read the book. It's self-documenting. <laughs> this is... Thank you. This is problematic because it's really long. And so I'm willing to you know, grant that it may be beautifully written. But it's not a problem. You know, you're just trolling people there. And you're doing the same thing when you've got 100,000 lines of code and you say, well, it's self-documenting code. Yeah, you, you, know what, you know what I'm getting at. You need an introduction. You need some kind of introduction, a blurb. You know, I mean, think a summary of what it's about. So there isn't really a way to avoid the need for an introduction when you have a large body of code, a large system, because it's just too much to get a grip with in the first 10 minutes on the project, on day one. You know, what, what do you want to understand on day one? If you just want to kind of dive in and start reading code, you probably will understand less. Um, an introduction consists of a purpose and scope and a summary. So say, what is the purpose of this system? Why does this code exist? What does it do? How much does it do, roughly? What does it kind of functionally cover? And, you know, what kind of... What, the summary of code is, what is its architecture? What are, what are the large-scale components? And this could be very small. You know, a few sentences on each of these will give you a much greater initial understanding of some software than just diving in and reading War and Peace, where presumably it's the whole point that it takes a long time. Because it's not a novel. Code is not a novel. Maybe it's poetry, but that's a completely different talk. And there are explanations. Code, <laughs> code is kind of abstract. Um, but by giving examples of how you would use it or what's gonna, what is going to happen when you run it, you can get a lot more understanding. Because as humans, we like concrete things. We like the concrete examples. And these are things that are going to help new team members understand the stuff better. But of all of these, purpose is the most important. So, for example, as a coder, I find this picture quite disturbing. There's something wrong with this picture. I want to know why these London telephone boxes are not the same colour. And I can inspect the telephone boxes all day. And I probably won't figure it out by inspecting the telephone box. The telephone box can't tell me. So explain why. And code can't explain why either. I don't think it's possible for code to explain why it exists. Perhaps it's an interesting question. So explain the why. I mean, explaining the why is such a powerful idea that there's a whole management book about it. I haven't read this book either, but my boss recommends it. And we all, have to <laughs> and we all start presentations with, you know, explain the why. Well, that kind of makes sense. And so do this with the code as well. Explain why we're here, why we're here within, in the code. And so sometimes you are going to have to compromise on the documentation avoidance. And, you know... You're not going to get away with it all the time. You can get away with it some of the time, some of the time, just, just not all. So if you are going to do some documentation, because you have no choice, at least you can minimize the pain. Right? So let's talk about how to minimize the pain a bit. Um, documentation that doesn't feel like documentation. And so you know, this is all about no word processors, for example. Don't do things the old-fashioned way. Um, we're quite good at doing things a new way, inventing new ways of doing things. So try that. So there's lots of kinds of documentation that don't particularly feel like documentation. For example, code. The example of writing tests to explain some of the things that you would otherwise need docs for is probably more appealing. It won't solve the whole problem, but it will solve part of it. Sometimes diagrams on a whiteboard also chip away at the problem. And the other stuff we do, you know, we, we talk in chat rooms, team chat. We, we type a lot of text in whatever language, English or Estonian or something else, during the course of our working day as coders. Can't we use some of that instead of documentation? I think we can. But still, you know, so text is kind of easy, though. I mean, diagrams are harder. So let's, let's proceed with these ideas. So I am going to have to talk about code comments. And I'm sorry for that, because it's a bit of a taboo subject. 
you know, the room always goes quiet. Code comments. And the thing is that I'm not quite sure why people get so weird about comments. But just consider that they're not that bad compared to the other forms of documentation. You could do worse. They're kind of universal. Think of them as tweets or something. Maybe you can mind trick yourself into thinking that writing comments is okay. But treat them like part of the code, in the code. Maintain them as part of the code. But there are alternatives. If you don't want to do comments, do something else instead. So the great thing about looking at different ways of doing documentation is that you have choices. You know, if there's something you really don't want to do, don't do it, because it will make you unhappy. For example, this is from a blog post describing how to write the perfect com commit message, suggesting that comments are ridiculous and you shouldn't write comments in your code, but you should write a commit message that starts with a short summary and then several paragraphs explaining the changes you're making. I mean, this for me is horrible, but if this, if this works instead, it's kind of the same thing. But it, instead of describing the current state of the code, as in comments, you're describing the changes. Actually, that's kind of like event sourcing for documentation. That's, that's kind of a cool idea. And if, presumably this is good if you've got the right kind of tooling support, that when you look at code, you see the documentation of how it's changed. Maybe that's a good way to understand code. So commit messages um, can work as an alternative to comments. You know, describe change. Maybe in some systems that gives you a much greater understanding. Or maybe it just is more likely to get information from development team members into text format where you can search it and find it and the like. Another new idea is readme-driven development um, from a blog post. This is a great idea. At first, I thought this was just a, another kind of quick joke, because anything driven development has to be, has to be great, has to be funny. Um, but actually, there's a kind of serious idea here, which is that um, traditionally, there was too much documentation. You know, I remember in the past when we had huge volumes of code, so huge volumes of documentation, functional specifications and technical specifications, and they were useless and out of date and took years to write. Um, the other extreme is to not have any documentation at all, and that can be quite a painful situation, a high-risk situation from a project point of view, even. And so the middle ground that readme-driven development gives you is not in the middle, it's almost nothing. Think one page, think a short text file describing the basic introduction to your project. This is way better than nothing. Maybe this is all you need. So start with just the readme that describes your system, and maybe you're done. But don't have nothing. And so this is, this is all about resetting how we think about documentation. Don't think of it as a big thing. Think of it as a tiny, small thing, just to, just to do the things that the code can't do. Um, here's another kind of documentation that I've seen. Um, a, you know, TIL, Today I Learned Documents. Little independent snippets of um, how to do something captured by a team member in order to explain something once. But captured in a very simple way um, as a markdown file just in a GitHub repo where you can just view it in line, simplifying the tooling. So this is starting to look a little bit more like traditional documentation in the sense that we have sort of paragraphs and instructions and stuff, but produced in a very simple way. So I'm not just thinking then about um, writing less or minimizing what you write, but I'm also thinking about minimizing the pain and effort of writing it. If you're a developer, use the tools that you like to use. Use the tools that you're already using. Definitely don't go and use other kinds of non-developer writing tools like word processors. That will not be a happy experience. Um, and this scales up. You can have lots of documentation if you want it or need it. So, you know, you can have a whole repository full of markdown files. And this works really well. It's very simple, very low tech, very searchable. Search is very important in documentation. Trivial easy to search for your local checkout, for example. Um, sometimes you want to add more documentation. And tutorials and um, tutorials can be very useful because they're very task focused. And so why would you write more documentation than almost none? Well, maybe that's going to have a lot of value for somebody. You might find that if you write a tutorial, you know, you get thanked so much because you've really solved somebody's problem. If you publish these online, you can get famous because a tutorial can be the only online solution to a very specific problem in a very specific combination of technologies. And you, you wouldn't have to write it if it already existed. 
And if you've, if you've written some bit of unique content that has excellent Google ranking, so do this stuff in public. And you get them more feedback and more encouragement. So this is then about thinking about the value of the documentation that you write. If you're going to have to write some using simple tools and keeping it concise, short, also go for high value and maximize the value by solving people's problems because everybody's smart, but everybody's busy. And you're saving people time, and they'll love you for it. So solve high-value problems for the maximum number of people. That's why Stack Overflow is great, because it's public. Sometimes you end up having to write documentation because you need to document a public API. Um, this is an example of um, API documentation from Spotify. Um, I've not actually used this API either. But um, this is recommended as an example of excellent documentation. Um, if you're going to write documentation, write excellent documentation. How do you do that? Well, look for the excellent examples. Find out what people really like and do similar things. So there's lots to like about this. But what's interesting about this kind of documentation is that it doesn't include pages of text, the thing that's less pleasant to write. It's lots of very small bits of text um, in, a, in a very detailed structure. So API documentation is, you know, can be quite nice to write because you don't have to kind of be faced with a big blank page. You're filling in gaps in a description of how a system works. This is the kind of documentation you'd have to write because it would be high value. Right? Particular example in that API documentation in Spotify is this description of the fields of um, a record, of an album with songs on it. This is very old school kind of documentation. This is a data dictionary, I guess it would have been called. You know, go back a while. Um, and quite often, this is extremely valuable documentation for many systems. Um, I've worked on a lot of business systems where um, what they were really doing was managing some data, pushing data around. They didn't really do much else. And so the thing that was hard in that system was the understanding the data. Um, the code can't tell you what something means. So sometimes you just needed that one sentence to explain what, what are copyrights on an album? What does that mean? Maybe it's industry jargon. Maybe it's domain language. Notably, the best API docs seem to have been handwritten. I mean, there are tools. But the tools don't write the docs for you. So in the same way that if you use you know, Medium to read and write blog posts, that can be a very useful tool for making the, the blog author experience better. But it doesn't actually write the blog post for you. And, and the API tools don't write the docs for you. So don't be misled into thinking that you don't have to do it. If you need API docs, you need them. Um, but maybe not internally. Internally, you can probably just look at the code. Team chat is an interesting opportunity. I, I think maybe it's become more popular. I think it used to be a bit more limited, but in corporate environments, it's become much more common to have some kind of team chat. New chat products seem to be announced all the time. And so potentially, if you've got searchable team chat and the search is crucial, maybe you have less need for documentation because you can search for documentation in the form of Q&A that happened on the team chat. This is why you need search. And this is why when you don't have search, you're missing an opportunity. Don't use Skype group chat for team, doc team chat because there's no search. Pay for Slack because this is valuable functionality. Or use something where you have search. So think about team chat. Use team chat in that way. You know, write questions and answers so you can find them again. That doesn't really feel like writing documentation. That just feels like talking to your colleagues, but in a searchable way that the face-to-face -face conversation doesn't have, because recording all of your conversations would be weird. So don't do that. Um, getting even further away from the code, there are other kind of more you know long-form things, and. Fortunately, we're not faced with using word processors anymore as programmers. I think that's pretty much gone away, replaced first by wikis. But wikis as documentation tools um, look like they're becoming less common on software teams because of all of the other newer things. And that's interesting. I mean, the wikis haven't really evolved much in recent years. And um, my favorite wiki is GitHub wiki because it's so simple and so limited. Simple's good. Um, I was, brain, I was brainstorming, thinking about other kinds of documentation. What could there be? Um, and so I thought of another kind of documentation that is um, sadly uncommon. There are two exception types in this example. Um, why don't we use cat macros for documentation? Right? This is an illegal kitten. 
This is a no kitten. There's not enough humour in documentation. Humour is an interesting topic for documentation, I think, because it makes it a bit more palatable for the reader. Now, this is an interesting kind of documentation. This is um, a programming language tutorial. And there are lots of programming language tutorials, but this one is different because right at the start it says the purpose of this tutorial is to teach you enough prologue to be able to understand the prologue light bulb joke. That is a, a fascinating premise for a tutorial, but an intriguing one. I mean, the, the long and short of it is, um, I don't know if you know any prologue, in, in prologue, by the time you've written this much prologue, and it's all very complicated, it's kind of frustrating when you run it and the interpreter just says false. And so the <laughs> prologue light bulb, the prologue light bulb joke um, is uh, how many false? <laughs> so let's wrap up with some practical things. Um, I mentioned introductions. Write introductions. Explain the purpose. Publish stuff. Um, you know, minimise this. But when you're going to do it, make it higher value and make it public. Um, write good code in preference. You know, reduce the need for the documentation before writing the documentation. But in the meantime, you probably need some documentation. Delete the documentation you don't need any more. Uh, that's, that's as satisfying as deleting code. So if you're not deleting documentation, you're doing something wrong. You should regularly delete documentation. When is the last time any of us deleted some documentation? Who dare? That's, that's quite liberating if you can get to that. So write good comments in your code. Um, there, I said it. Um, try and do, do this by just writing, the, writing really short. Do the same thing as I suggested for the rest of the documentation. Keep it short. Write one sentence per class. If it's so easy to write that it took you five seconds, it was probably clear enough that you didn't need to write that comment, so you can just delete it again. If it takes you more than 30 seconds to write the comment, it was probably really necessary, so stick it out until you get to the end of the sentence. You know, maybe it takes days, because you have to go around the room and ask everybody what this code is, and nobody knows. You've discovered a documentation need. Um, another particular kind of documentation that can be high enough value to make it worthwhile are the step-by-step -step things that say, with idiot-proof instructions, step one, you know, click this, enter this command, um, repeatable procedures. And try and make this documentation unnecessary by automating it as well. So the same kind of approach. If you have repetitive tasks, make sure they're documented, but ideally, that documentation should be minimal. Standard advice is think about who it's for. If you don't know who it's for, you probably shouldn't be writing it. Maybe it's not necessary. Maybe it's not for anyone. Right? So don't write unnecessary documentation. Write documentation for yourself. If you're writing for the development team, the person who's going to be most happy is yourself in six months' time when you see something that you don't remember anymore. This happens. Especially if it's not six months, but it's six years and you've been tracked down and made to come and explain this legacy code. Right? Future you will thank you. And as I've said several times, write less documentation. This bears repeating, because documentation is waste and the result of failure demand. So you definitely need some, but as little as possible. Some systems have particular complexity in that particular system. So in some systems, the data model is very complex, hundreds of tables in a relational database. Some systems model complex business processes. Um, each different kind of complexity has a kind of documentation that is most suitable for that. So these kind of things you rarely need in detail, but sometimes you do need one of them for a system, except for UML. I don't think any of us really ever need UML. Who uses UML, seriously? Nobody. I mean, draw boxes, but nobody can remember what the arrows mean. So um, don't do things that are too complex. And, and choose the kind of documentation that, that suits you. So that, that suits you, that suits the problem you're solving. There are lots of different kinds of documentation. So these are things I've mentioned. And you can even give presentations as a kind of documentation. Um, I mean, I'm having fun. Right? Um, XML-based technology seemed like a good idea at the time. Typically, they're not. So. Use simple technology, including the content, as well as the tools. Markdown is king. Be funny in documentation. It will make it so much less painful. And, and you, can learn, you can learn how to do humor. It's not some mysterious thing. Um, practicing helps. So skip to the end. Choose the appropriate tools. 
Don't write a book. Well, maybe write a book, because it's great fun, but it takes a long time. So this, is the, um, so this is a book I wrote with colleagues a few years ago. And it was really good experience, and I learned a lot. But it is the waterfall development method of documentation. It took two years to do this before the you know, release. So not necessarily something you should do. Right, skip to the end of this, because uh, I run out of time. I said all of these things before. The slides are online on the website. So go and look at them again, show them to everybody else. And uh, don't write the documentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.